missing tone, right? And mm -hmm. David? Yeah. Oh, and Chia as well. Right, I knew there was something else. Um, okay, so we'll, we'll wait for a couple, a few more minutes to get a couple more of uh, the missing jurors and then we'll, we'll start with the introductions and so on. Oh, I see David already, cool. Meet me a long time no see. How have you been? <laughs> I've been good. How are you guys? Good. Or folks, I should say. You got the proper the proper nomenclature. Folks. Got a, got a folks, folks. I've been trying to train myself. It's the more more uh, gender neutral. Uh, <laughs> okay. Hmm. Okay, well, I just take the Chia. Uh, both Chia and Tom confirm, right, Lord? Uh, yeah, they accepted the um, calendar invite that I sent out. So, okay. Actually, let me double check to see it. Yeah, it's joining us right now. Okay, so maybe Casey, should we get like uh, start with introducing the jurors? Hopefully, between that and talking about the studio, then Tom will jump in, and then and you know we'll be on time. Okay, so um, so thanks everyone for joining us today, and I'll introduce the jurors first, so everyone knows each other, and even though the names are on the screen. And then we'll introduce, uh, Casey and I introduce the studio and we'll, we'll get started. So we have today um, uh, Shia Gu, um, who's a PhD candidate at UCLA. It's a co-director of uh, Spinagu. It's the current director of, uh, and creator of materials and applications and newly appointed director at the MAC uh, Center at the Schindler House. Um, we have Kutan Ayata. Uh, co-founder of uh, Young Ayata, uh, based in New York and now in Los Angeles. It's a 
Associate Professor and Vice Chair at the Department of Architecture and Urbanism at UCLA. Uh, also just like coming west now at the moment, already here, I don't know, but uh, we'll, you know, welcome to LA. Uh, Mimi Seiger, critic, editor, curator, and faculty at, at SIARC. Um, and also Mimi's been involved uh, with these guys, you know, in last spring, so it's great to have you back. Uh, Jonathan Neal, uh, who's associate professor and uh, founding director at the Center for Business and Management of the Arts at Claremont Graduate University. Uh, he's also, uh, interestingly enough, had a, uh, has a kind of uh, original training background in architecture from Cornell and a PhD from Columbia. Uh, so very interesting having you, Jonathan. Uh, Tom Wiscom, who's maybe not here, or I, I don't see him, but, but should be here soon. Principal of Tom Wiscom Architecture and is the undergraduate program chair at SIARC. Uh, David Rue, who's director of Rue Klein and is the postgraduate programs chair. And Damian Jovanovic uh, is co-founder of uh, Lifeform uh, I.O. <laughs> it's a faculty at SIARC and it's also uh, a, a sort of a co-conspirator in the architectural technologies cohort. Uh, he's taught these guys throughout the year and he's taught uh, them this uh, summer um, in a sort of design lab uh, component. And then Sumin Ham, who's not here and might not be here, but in case she comes, is also founder of uh, Sumingham Design, also faculty at SciArc, and along with uh, along with Damien, they done the they did the uh, design lab component of the studio. Um, so everyone, I mean, you guys got the C levels of the studio. Um, I don't know if you got a chance to read it. I first. For those of you coming from outside, uh, so this is uh, Architectural Technologies um, Studio. It's the last, the last semester of a um, three. It's one year long uh, postgraduate program. Uh, one of the four or five postgraduate programs at SIAR. Um, so they begin in the fall and they end at the end of the summer. Uh, students have been with Casey and myself Throughout the year, they had uh, my vertical, my introductory vertical on the fall. They went uh, and they had KC on the sort of a design lab component, which is acts as a kind of seminar building the sort of arsenal of tools, techniques, software, and ideas associated with what the, the, the program uh, speculates on, which is ideas on technology very much associated these days with uh, ideas of artificial intelligence and automation in relation to, in relation to design and, and the architectural field at large. And in the spring, they had the possibility of choosing between at least three studios, um, uh, three option studios. David Rue was one of them. And, and they had a, a seminar, also the uh, you know, second installment of the design lab, which was taught by um, Casey and Mimi and on the topic of, um, of housing and uh, the future of housing and AI. And so precisely because of that, we sort of built for this studio, which is co-taught by Casey and myself and, in, uh, and with Laura Michelon um, as, a, as assistant teacher, um, built on the foundation of that seminar and tries to kind of position the topic of housing as the kind of center of uh, our design exploration and speculation. Uh, the, the title is Housing Constellations and um, Aggregate Worlds. It sort of suggests this, um, this sort of double notion. Uh, one, an idea of scale, the, the idea that ideas of bottom up uh, related to housing units can create sort of larger clusters and aggregates and that can begin to sort of uh, um, access a sort of level of the whole. The other one is the aspect that the uh, house in itself and could, especially in this sort of day and age, uh, we are living in more, but in general, uh, associated with sort of large projects uh, of residential or mixed use environment, 
uh, access this level of kind of world making. You know, it produces almost like a kind of bubble uh, to live in, and 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 whereas ideas of the individual and the collective uh, begin to sort of coalesce and and even get sort of blurred and fuzzy. Um, the studio kind of results um, of uh, sort of early um, early ideas associated with maybe archigram or even uh, metabolism or or maybe brutalism that 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 take housing front and center and maybe produce sort of more utopic ideas uh, or uh, autonomous uh, ideas if you see in some of the cases of uh, metabolism in, in Japan or Asia. Um, so. Uh, it, the studio sort of takes that on, but but rather than think of uh, of producing another sense of utopia uh, today, uh, where the sense of disconnection between these new models or typologies as amazing and and uh, forward looking they might be, seem a little bit out of sync with what the the world we live in today, it suggests that the 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 environment, the context the even the technologies around us and in relation to those contexts and sites and environments uh, could be a driving force to making those projects not just a world in and of themselves but almost like a kind of constellation with the worlds around it and so this is a bit of a of a, um, of a sort of conceptual um, uh, approach to the studio uh, that somehow suggests that at the level of the unit uh, or at the level of the individual and at the level of the whole or the level of the collective in between those those two uh, large components there is a there's a kind of rich potential to reconceive notions of inhabitation in 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 today's uh, in today's world so um, i'm going to pass it on to casey maybe to describe the kind of maybe more specifics and and, and technological size of it and please feel free to kind of add in anything that i might have forgotten Your muted casing. That's not very technically sophisticated. Um, so uh, for the, the last few years that Marcel and I have talked to the studio together, we have a general um, sequence where the first three weeks of the studio are set up as a kind of uh, technical workshop or accelerator with uh, different topics each year. This year we were specifically looking at combining AI with other or neural networks with other kinds of non-learning um, intelligent agent algorithms, specifically looking at organizing housing blocks and automating um, plan production and uh, massing production for um, modular housing structures. Uh, at the beginning of the workshop, the students had the option to explore one of three sites that we gave. Uh, one is in El Segundo, which is um, in a kind of exurban uh, uh, location between commercial and industrial um, and uh, residential neighborhoods uh, south of LAX here in Los Angeles. The uh, second one was in the Desert Hot Springs area, kind of at the foothills of the mountain range separating uh, Desert Hot Springs from Joshua Tree uh, Park, um, about two hours east of Los Angeles in the desert. And then the third site was um, a coastal development area in Ventura adjacent to the agriculture of uh, Camarillo and Oxnard area um, as their third choice. The uh, workshop started out with the students collectively as a class developing a program-based uh, neural network that was trained to translate uh, building footprints and uh, massing slices into organizational diagrams for programs. Um, from a, We have a couple hundred precedents that they painstakingly traced and uh, mapped in its training. Uh, they also were working with kind of scripted massing uh, generators through kind of procedural agent techniques for growing massings from uh, plan master plans, um, slicing those, converting them back into the program uh, diagrams using the neural networks. And then um, the kind of final step of that was de designing a series of modular components that could be organized on those program diagrams, both in terms of um, their program performance features, but also in terms of their um, positional and formal context in terms of like connectivity um, interior versus exterior, and those types of concerns. Um, here's some example of like an early version of this from uh, Jennifer, where um, the plans initially were kind of graphically very exciting, but performatively uh, maybe less um, less plausible. And through kind of working back and forth between the component design, the networks, and the interpretation algorithms, I'm starting to produce more plausible um, building massings. 
and uh, interior plans. The final step of the workshop, the students uh, developed a master plan strategy for organizing these assemblages onto the site um, to kind of kick off the rest of the semester. Here's another example of some components, um, kind of initial plans, um, the kind of iteration towards more performative uh, modules and interiors, um, and then a kind of master plan strategy by Isabel and Robin. Um, at this point in the at the, this point in the semester, the students then um, develop their own research projects around um, this, these housing um, strategies, and uh, some of them kind of continued on the process of kind of modularity and automation of construction. Other students went in different directions in terms of um, reconsidering like how um, housing could respond to contemporary conditions and technologies. I think that's it. Uh, so I think uh, we can go ahead and get started with our uh, first project for the afternoon, which is uh, Jennifer Lutner. Are you uh, all set? Yep, I'm ready. Great. Thanks. Okay, so um, I'm Jennifer. Thank you guys for coming and looking at all of our work. Uh, as Casey was saying, I was one of those people who kind of started to step away from the modularity of this. And um, so yeah, I'll just dive into project and you can see. Oh, I think I forgot to share it with sound. One second. This project is titled Inhabit to suggest a place of dwelling for the future inevitable climate refugees seeking safety from inadequate outdoor conditions due to pollution, toxins, and particulate matter from the global climate crisis. The goal of this project is to design a housing community grid in El Segundo that is safe from pollution of the nearby refinery, the city, and its freeways, all while analyzing the wind direction and pollution levels, providing clean energy, cleaning the air, and providing public space. These can be done through direct air capture, nuclear small modular reactors, and an absorbing material called titanium dioxide. Direct air capture is a process of capturing carbon dioxide directly from the ambient air, while titanium dioxide is a mineral compound that absorbs and breaks down pollutants when exposed to sunlight. Nuclear SMRs are a type of nuclear fission reactor, which is smaller, safer, and more efficient than conventional reactors. The site is located near the El Segundo coast among industrial operations for aviation and petroleum. The area of El Segundo was actually named El Segundo or the second due to it being the second refinery built by Chevron. Though it does a lot of good for the area, the Chevron company is known as one of the largest corporate polluters in the world. And this refinery is located right next to residential areas with coastal winds pushing the toxins into all of these neighborhoods. A site was chosen just east of the Chevron refinery on a vacant lot between the Douglas train station and train tracks. I then used a style transfer from Ostagram, sampling other grid site conditions and patterns to provide a gridded site layout for which we will determine the location of building masses and breaking up of the site. Buildings were then formed using a script with Python for Rhino to arrange the previous grid elements into organized masses from the footprints of the samplings of the style transfer sites. Once the masses were formed, I then used wind direction to determine where the impact on the masses can either carve wind tunnels or provide a placement for the air capture systems. The remaining carving is done by the AI-generated site, forming the building into a vessel-like object with the angled chunks on the west end, helping to guide particles from wind to the absorbent structure. The facade itself is then influenced by another Ostagram style transfer, which determined where some of the openings and panels were placed. The scattered structure filtering systems will be placed based on the wind's impact to the building, which begins to penetrate the building while keeping the interior safe from toxins. The result of this collective form in the context of this studio is the fuzzy aggregate. By its overlaying of parts and strategies developed through both automated and manual design and through its relationship of its structure and massing, there is a tension created through these dissimilar elements. Its formal composition takes on a neo-brutalist demeanor for its fusion of pragmatic rigidness and new technologies within the current anthropogenic epoch. 
The grid structures which penetrate through the whole building act as filters from the exterior, while the interior converts to piping systems with healthy breathable air, able to grow plants through hydroponic systems. The result of its integration into the site creates a safely enclosed environment with sustainably clean air on the interior, providing a safe space for climate refugees. Now I'll share with you a short clip which will aid in understanding the project's intent and impact. Despite all of the warning signs, the smog, changing weather patterns, excessive use of light, the forest fires, and other natural disasters, air pollution is still the world's largest environmental health threat. We have led ourselves to the anthropogenic age exposure to outdoor air is no longer safe for our health. We've turned to architecture to find ways to preserve natural air and keep us safe from pollutants. By harvesting it, we've turned pollution into a resource for things like plastics, fuels, inks, and others. The absorbent titanium dioxide on the filtered scaffolding and exterior panels allows this habitable space to be one of the few buildings left that are exposed to open outdoor air due to its detoxifying nature. What was once able to grow outside is now made available by hydroponics within the clean air interiors. They disperse into each of the living units, bringing a piece of nature to all of the climate refugees. The time is now to take steps necessary to protect the land and atmosphere in which we inhabit. That's my presentation. I'll jump in. <laughs> um, thanks, Jennifer, for this. It's um, it's a, it's a really interesting to see the interweaving of um, emergent tech with questions of climate crisis, um, and, and I guess maybe within the the world building that you have going on here, um, you're using the term climate refugees, and um, is it the this this kind of goes to the massing. Is is the intent that this is a housing complex which would absorb um, basically refugees from the surrounding parts of El Segundo, um, so that um, that in a way it becomes a kind of arc for the neighborhood, it, um, or or is it meant to be a kind of a? Are you thinking of it more as a buy-in, uh, you know, more market rate? Uh, yeah, so um, like right now, I think the, the term climate refugees is like for the more drastic areas that are be, being affected by climate change. But I think 
um, what this project is intending is um, looking at like a near future where like everything is affected by climate change. So we have to take a look at um, all of our architecture and how, like what we're what we're doing to it and like what it's taking in and what it's putting out and um, looking at basically everyone like just humanity as a climate refugee in this case. How how many units are are in here? How many how many floors? How many units? Uh, there's about twelve floors um, of living units, and I didn't design the at like the actual space of how big the units would be. Like I said, I, I took a, a detour from the modularity from earlier this semester um, and focused on other things, but. Uh, It's a pretty large scale building, so it fit quite a lot. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think um, I think it's a really beautiful building. Thank um, you. And it's strange. I was just driving back from San Diego this weekend and was commenting on the fact that it's so weird when you come from Southern California that the first building, you come to the iconic skyline of, of LA and the first building that you get really close to is the prison or the jail, which apparently is the largest jail in the United States. I didn't know that. Um, but that the, the reason it reminds me of your, of your building somehow is that it, it, it does, it seems very much um, closed off you said yourself, it's kind of riffing on brutalism, and it has those tiny little slit windows, and it, it definitely seems like a, def a defensive structure of some kind, um, and I, I appreciate that because it doesn't totally square with this, with, with the kind of openness that we usually see with, um, with, with architects who are interested in this kind of work. Usually, you kind of have a sentimental approach to it where it, it somehow needs to look like it's green or look like fresh air by having all the, the planted balconies and all the landscaping around it and all of that. And I think it's really smart of you to take this on in a, a kind of a dark, it feels dark to me, it's like a dark project. Um, and I, and I, I, I think that's okay and I think it's good to see it. And I, um, I don't think that, that uh, I, in other words, I think it's, it's, it resonates more because it's kind of like hardcore reality. It's like a concrete project, literally, um, rather than a kind of visionary or, or fantasy project. And and um, and I, I really appreciate that. And like all of your green stuff here, it doesn't read sentimentally like a um, picturesque garden nested inside of a building courtyard. It reads more like a piece of tech. And uh, and so, yeah, so I mean, I got a lot of time for this approach and I, I think, you know, it's, uh, it, it's it's kind of off-putting and kind of shocking on the one hand, but um, but on the other, I think I think it, somehow its darkness resonates now for me more than than a, than a kind of happy um, uh, uh, sort of easily accessed project that we've seen so many times. The only thing, though, I would say is I am always a little bit suspicious from the get-go on projects that rely too much on a particular technology particularly when it gets, it turns into a, a kind of expression, like the scaffolding element that you have, when, you know, as we know, technology so often, uh, um, when it's actually worked out and actually gonna be installed into a building, it, um, it goes through the gigantic sieve of engineering and performance testing and all of that. And usually it comes out a kind of a product, a standardized thing, um, and has much less kind of spatial spatial consequence as you might want it to have. And so I just always worry a, a little bit about when, you know, using using tech like this in an expressive way, which is how I read it, um, when it's something that's a lot out of the control of the architect's hand. And so so I only, and, I, and again, I don't mean it, I, I, I don't mean this sort of fantically, I just mean like worry like when you, when you embark on a project like this for you as an architect, um, that it, it's, it will be a difficult one because you will very often not be able to control the concrete area of this project that we're seeing right now, but not the rest of it. So, um, so just a thought.
Maybe I can I can jump here and pick up on the darkness that uh, Tom brought up. Um, and I'm, I guess I'm an Angelina by title, but not yet uh, moved into the city. And by kind of listening to your presentation, I'm having second you know second thoughts. Like, oh my God, do I really want to go there? It sounds kind of crazy, smoke and fire and everything else. And um, I, I think. Like to identify those conditions um, um, as an architect is important to be able to project to their future uh, equally so. And I think it's an aesthetic position to take uh, in terms of where you stand, how that future begins to feel like. Um, and one extreme could be that uh, it's all dark and um, kind of dystopian and the other extreme, of course, we solve all these problems and it's all uh, greenery and happy. And probably the truth lies somewhere in between, uh, or maybe the plausibility, I guess, as mentioned in the brief, um, kind of lies somewhere in between. It was kind of interesting to see uh, through this pandemic in New York City, uh, where I still am, uh, how people kind of responded to their needs of maybe isolation, need to have um, you know outdoor space, fresh air, uh, or let's say purity of nature where they, they could escape uh, you know air con contaminant air, and that was to vacate the city. That was not to kind of create safe interiors, but it was like the impulse was really to um, kind of leave. Like my building, I live in a fifty-five unit building. 75% of our building is empty. Um, people have been away for months. Um, and I'm wondering, um, and I'm gonna speak maybe less about the particulars of uh, the architectural characteristics of your project, but maybe the framing of uh, the closed world that you're suggesting or, or, or the kind of um, you know, world making within the building, whether it would be more plausible to think that is a world in which uh, you kind of create a normal nature where we escape uh, the world outside um, or it would be a world that you can imagine that's not necessarily for people who are trying to run away from the condition of the city as it develops, densifies, um, pollutes, uh, etc. but defines other kinds of conditions, other kinds of environmental um, possibilities. Because uh, I think uh, the kind of problem I have in the premise of suggesting that, well, I can throw all this technology uh, to this building and create this pure interiority that um, kind of takes me to a kind of nostalgic uh, purity of the nature and everything is going to be fine. Um, that all of a sudden creates a, a exclusive condition. Uh, and if you're talking about kind of housing and equality, I think uh, th that that to me uh, is something to rethink. Um, I, I, I can imagine all kinds of environments that uh, one could collectively share and imagine in the future of the city that deviates from the purity of an idealism when you begin to think about nature. Because I think kind of this notion of um, you know pure nature and culture, um, it's not separable. Uh, we're, it's kind of all mixed up. We cannot kind of imagine one without the other. Um, so I think to that end, I would kind of think whether that world you're imagining um, is kind of return to an ideal or um, kind of uh, a different direction towards something far more uh, perhaps speculative and um, charged. Can I can I have, hop in here for a second, uh, Jennifer? Yeah, this is kind of the nail. Um, what what were some of the thoughts you had about the the manner in which the building is inhabited? It's good that it's coming on these images right now, um, because you once you talk about sort of climate refugees, and you and you have this kind of incredible armature that's being in, itself is kind of being inhabited by various different systems. Um, but then the kind of habitable spaces look like they are being taken over by this kind of professional managerial class of upwardly mobile folks wandering around in these, you know, lovely interiors. And so I'm sort of wondering, like, 
what were what were some of the if those were the ideas what are some of the ways of challenging that um that sort of convention uh for a building like this yeah uh so there was a lot that went into that um symbolically like the, the way that pollution take has taken over the structure has taken over the building as well so it's like you can't really escape it um but in this way it's it's um kind of like acting like a lung where it's taking something in and it's it's releasing something, but what it's it's not uh, having damage that's being done to it. It's trying to make something that's like good uh, come from this pollution. So um, by filtering it, creating new resources and um, having uh, it turn into something good on the inside, it's, it is kind of an escape from the exterior. Um, yeah, does that does that answer the question? And then the 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 way that the, these were framed, um, I wanted to be like a drastic change of like this kind of dark, um, polluted city, then to this like bright open um, interior that does feel a little more welcoming and um, like there's there's access to this this greenery in all of the apartments. It's not just like through the atrium. It's it, it is really breathing into all of the spaces. Okay, I get, I get that. Um, this might come off sounding a little uncharitable, but don't take it that way. But it also sounds like it's taking in the otherwise destitute refugees and turning them into, you know, healthy members of a contributing sort of capital oriented group. I don't know. I mean, a cleansing, a cleansing of the population in a certain way as well in terms of the way that they're inhabiting the interior. Yeah. I view it more of as, as like a, um, a warning that that would be like a, a last resort sort of thing. Like, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it's it, it's it's super interesting along those lines because uh, I, I agree with everything the, the other the other uh, studio critics have said so far in terms of this, you know, this, this great way of, of not going for some sort of, you know, quasi aesthetically utopian form or or or, or format. Um, and so the, the, the building operates as this kind of machine and it's brutalist and the, the armature of the, of this scaffold, um, is a kind of filter that grows on the building itself in some way, um, and inhabits that, that armature in interesting ways. I think that the, the thing that I'm curious about is kind of how, how it gets inhabited, right? And the, and the, and the way that, that people become another system, the inhabitants become another system that um, manipulate and articulate the, the building and its appearance and the way that it, and the way that it's used. Um, and, and, and maybe along the lines of some of the things that you just said in terms of this kind of bringing in and, and cleansing or becoming a refuge. Um, but I'd be sort of curious to think the, think through that 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 the that the inhabitants themselves are a system that somehow is left out of this at, at, at currently, um, and could present interesting ways of of um, of bringing it to one more one more level, like this gentleman here with the pads on his elbows, sipping <laughs> sipping a drink. Um, I, you know, there, there seem like other ways that you could see a kind of collective in, in inhabitation of this. Which is itself, you know, operating along some of the same ideals that you're talking about in terms of a kind of new new way of building a world inside of a of a, a both at once closed and open system like this. Jennifer, I think there's a lot of um, really great tensions happening in your project, and I think that there are both like old and new ideas um, within architecture that are being played out. So, um, kind of following Jonathan's. Um, comment there's the sense of like a lifestyle being supplied by the images you're producing which is a kind of lifestyle the post-industrial where um somehow i feel like i'm inhabiting between a freeway underpass and then like hem in 2025 hem the design shop you know because you've taken the kind of like extreme raw um like your exterior is this extreme raw interface where concrete and like, you know, titanium, I don't remember the exact mechanism, but the 
that kind of like delicate filigree are interfacing. So there's this really beautiful aesthetic play between um, delicate machinery and mechanics and infrastructure, like service infrastructure for air, and then like really raw concrete form um, that for me speaks more to like 1970s brutalism than post-industrial, but it has that. And then, um, and yet when you show us like the view inside, it's like, I'm in a hem showcase where everything is shiny and matches. And so I, I wonder, um, you know, I don't know, you know, this relationship you build, that's an image relationship between interior and exterior form and lifestyle and um, environment are a little bit jarring, which maybe reinforces this kind of critique of, you know, refugees become consumers, um, which you could rethink. But I still think that the things that are really powerful in your project is this um, kind of proposition you're making about the relationship between the built form and the systems of um, air filtration and the kind of um, the urgency of um, these mechanics of air that we need to think about and begin to build a relationship with in our architectures, right? So um, we kind of have, you know, Rainer Bam's written about this endlessly in, you know, the 70s, but uh, we haven't really updated the notion of like, what is a post-industrial climate era um, um, air system within our architectures. That's not like central heating. Um, so I, I think that's a really great start for your thesis project, which is that your proposition is that your, you as an architect would begin to think about this relationship that gets built up between mechanical systems that manage invisible systems like air and then material worlds like concrete and um, you know landscape and begin to think about weaving these together more intimately Maybe it's not happening through all the imagery you're making, but it's certainly happening through some of the um, um, sites of investigation you've built up for yourself within your own research project. And I think that's a really promising direction to go in. Yeah, I think um, I, I, I really agree with what Jonathan and Gia have been saying um, about sort of the questioning of the kind of lifestyle depicted here. I, I also agree with Tom and sort of the beauty of the somewhat, you know, the dystopia that is now um, as well, since it feels quite real. I just finished reading Octavia Butler's uh, The Parable of the Sower, which is set in 2024 in a, um, in a Los Angeles or a California that has pretty much like, you know, degraded to the point where people live in kind of uh, suburban compounds um, uh, if they have anything and and are you know destitute on the street uh, otherwise based on a uh, a climate reality not so different than what you're showing um, and I guess for me I think one of the things I know you've moved away from the modular but let's let's not think of it as modular let's think about uh, the kind of the the unit at uh, the scale of the body um, because I think that begins to answer some of the questions around what is what are the kind of interior conditions at human scale? Um, and how do some of those gestures at the human scale um, aggregate outward um, and meet the kind of larger scale of the system on the, uh, on the outside? So um, in, a, in a possible scenario, um, you know, what, what are the questions of waste, you know, internal wastewater, right? Um, if this is indeed a closed loop system, right? Where wastewater, composting, um, sort of uh, interior air toxins. Like I think there's um, an in, there's an interesting codependency that could start to happen between the the way that filtration is happening from the outside in, um, and then when it's happening sort of within the system. Makes sense. Uh, okay, great. Um, if, if there are any further comments, or um, we can, we'll move on to the next project. Just what I, I would just one last thing that I all of a sudden thought about listening to Mimi. Um, I don't know. May, maybe you came across in the studio. I can't remember. I didn't see any bibliography, but there's the that little uh, Slaughterdyke book called Terror from the Air. 
um, it was maybe maybe a decade ago or more now, where it talks about um, the first moment that uh, the air was recognized as part of the habitus, which was in uh, World War One with the development of mustard gas. Um, and the book is it, it talks about air conditioning and the sort of contemporary conditioning as be as being a, a, a our, the lived world is one of, of, of air conditioning now more broadly than just what we think of in terms of HVAC. Um, but it seems like there may be ideas in that that, that uh, might, might be um, fruitful, and productive, and, uh, and a, uh, a kind of a discourse or another vocabulary, another way of, of talking about or thinking about the stuff that you're already obviously doing a lot of thinking about. Sure, thank you for that. Thank you, guys. Hey, good job, Jennifer. Um, so uh, next we have Philippe. Are, are you ready? I'm um, good to go, yeah. Great. Good. Sharing here. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Philippe, and I hope you enjoy my video here. When we try to align new urban development with existing ecosystem conditions, we find ourselves selecting pieces of nature that are in line with human values. As conservationists attempt to battle this stagnation, we are seeing a shift towards maximizing ecosystem support without trying to recreate degraded biodiversity. A redefining of the term wild is occurring. As new and different species are finding success in our concrete worlds, they naturally pave the way for others. We have a responsibility to design spaces that clear the way for these pioneers. In this spirit, my project is interested in how buildings have the potential to create habitat for species other than their human residents and the aesthetic implications of this merger. I wanted to locate geometric relationships that would allow for the interpenetration of human and non-human spheres. Techniques and procedural aggregation gave me this unifying formal language. Throughout the first half of the semester, I built upon a script that stacks and merges primitive components in an art-directable way. I was able to control the attractive forces between components, their orientation, and how they responded to a bounding environment. I wanted to bring the coastal ecosystem into the building's main atrium and leave control over the interaction between residential and ecosystem programming to the script. This demanded a significant change in how the script functioned and helped me to redevelop my site strategy. The Ventura site encapsulates a public park directly abutting a thriving aquaculture industry and kelp forest ecosystem. I chose to replace the breakwater on site with my project as I'm interested in how a building can connect aquaculture, residential, and conservation programming. I wanted to explore whether a script-based approach could allow large-scale development and existing ecosystems to cooperate. By reforming and extending the existing breakwater, the building's core begins to serve as a nursery for future ecosystem growth and diversification. It is designed to provide literal scaffolding for the existing coastal ecosystem to grow onto. This entry is the beginning of a vertical gradient running from coastal wetland to residential hardscape. As we reach the equator of this gradient and the first point of connection between human and natural habitat, I directed the script to taper inwards as it continued to stack and orient primitives. This pinch occurs in the building's largest public observation deck and is meant to provide a direct connection for visitors and residents to the ecosystem this building penetrates. These public areas also extend the existing coastal park space in Ventura into a living museum. If we zoom out, we can get a better idea of how the center of the building functions almost like an injection point from the natural world into the concrete one that I have constructed. Each chunk of the aggregated form can be separated and viewed as a singular functional element. They all adhere to the same axes of symmetry, and habitable spaces could be found at nearly every orientation. Pieces of the residential tunnels open up into minor atriums of immense scale. This blurs the distinction for residents as to whether they are outside or in, whether they are at home or in public space. The atrium that surrounds them is itself encapsulated in another exterior bounding volume. This further scrambles residents' perceived distinction between human and non-human domains. As we continue upwards, we see the common spaces that are devoted only for residents. They are filled with nature, but it is curated, limited to convenient and aesthetically pleasing bounds. At this height, the aggregation script was tailored to allow the atrium to penetrate the external building envelope. This serves to let more light into the atrium and further blur the distinction between outdoor and in. This happens more frequently as we move up the building. These units were designed to maximize their openings into the interior atrium. Their vertical circulation was located where openings between the tunnels hovered over one another. The three you're seeing here represent the main unit types and are combined into one penthouse. The same algorithm was used to create every part of the building's residences. 
Their stairways were made by tracing the contours of more traditional architectural elements and replacing them with a simplified and scaled-down set of primitives. Their interlocking hallways were created by enlarging my base primitives and providing a dominant vector for them to follow as they stacked. Their penetration of the atrium was determined by allowing the script to locate alignments in scale and shape between the end of the tunnels and the stacked squares that form the atrium walls. This atrium represents my first attempt at divorcing exterior and interior surface articulation using a single geometric language. This project is my first attempt at cultivating a smooth gradient that results in reliable and distinct spatial divisions. The intruding residential tunnels actually form conduits of light to any plant or animal life that might have taken hold in the central atrium. The tide is allowed to rise into the atrium, bringing with it species looking for protected nighttime refuge or a place to raise young. Apertures in the building facade were also made in a procedural manner. Any where the, the agglomeration of interior, atrium, residential, and public areas created voids against the building's bounding volume, cuts became more frequent. The larger cuts in the building facade were sometimes repurposed as public viewing decks. The lightness of the interior atrium held against the monolithic concrete of my massing leaves the residential units feeling as though they were exposed to the elements, surrounded by a guardian with no interest in their protection. The building's dominant masses act as ambivalent scaffolding for the use of residents and aliens alike. My goal was to allow other species to find connections with our world that are untouched by any motive other than survival. Thank you guys. Um, hopefully the audio on your end is a little bit better than it was on mine, but um, I'll loop this last one and we can talk through it. Philippe, could you uh, just quickly, the, that last image that was more lateral, that seemed like it was more about the breakwater and the site, but was still fairly articulated. Could you describe the relationship between that uh, form that we just saw and then the, the larger sort of building form that takes up the bulk of the project? Um, so you're saying, sorry, the, the sectional view of the building that we're seeing here. Uh, oh, oh, you're saying right before this. Yeah, there's this sort of this right, when it when it goes from the sort of the description of the breakwater that 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 image, right? This guy here, right yeah. before that, right before that. Oh, this, this guy. That, um, yeah, yeah. This. What's the relationship of this to the next set of to the like the more um, articulated this to this piece? Sure. So uh, the floating turntables that you saw pr even uh, prior to that, as well as the, the horizontal pan, um, those are all aggregate studies of how the script I used were behaving. So um, different plays on the script that Casey was describing at the intro to the studio okay. um, and how components are stacked and oriented. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So studies in, in scale and uh, relationship from exterior to in. I love the underbelly of this thing. Like when you first, when you first said like the opening shot, you're, it kind of feels like you're going for a silhouette project and that seems really important. But at the end, when you get into it, I feel like the way that the thing kind of uh, hits the ground, but it's clearly like a, it feels like a, um, an eroded away kind of liquid grotto ground and somehow it just feel it, it just feels like um, uh, I don't know it just it's so beautiful the way it undercuts and the way it's very chunky and kind of broken and I, I think that's where your, your project is just totally amazing um, I, I know it's like it's not literally a ruin or not literally been eroded away by the water uh, but yeah, these, it seems like every view from underneath on your project is just very atmospheric and mysterious and larger than life. And uh, when we get up here, I get less convinced. I feel like, oh, there's the blocks now aren't this sort of mysterious construction, but rather they're sort of trying to make things for humans, like little stairs and floors and spiral staircases and all of that stuff, which is just, it's weird, but it's not like this, but but it's not as powerful as, as this idea of buildings kind of like, you know, having tiny, tiny footprints and just barely touching like by a molecule to the yeah. earth and almost like, you know, just having to deal with the water, with the water world condition. 
the idea was actually to replace a lot of the ground and, and actually do exactly what you're talking about. And when it comes to the, the more granular residential elements, um, that was piggybacking on some of the work we did for our design lab, where um, I, the idea was to uh, voxelize and um, re-aggregate existing architectural elements. And it was a bit of a departure from the rest of the thesis, but um, thank you for the feedback. I guess what um, I really appreciate the the kind of interspecies interdependence here. Um, this is something that um, Donna Haraway, of course, is talks about quite a bit, and the fact that we were talking about refuge in the last one, but the idea of a refugia that we we need spaces to begin uh, to prepare ourselves for the next. Uh, sort of uh, climate devastation and that, that that we can only do it if we are sort of intertwined um, with our sort of co-species. Um, and, and I guess for me, one of the uh, one of the representations that I'm not seeing, which but I think would be super helpful um, is to kind of have, um, even if it's sort of diagrammatic or sectional, um, to be able to sort of see where the watermarks are, like if this is indeed like a uh, like a reef, um, uh, which is what it kind of feels like, um, or a kind of sea pools, tide pools, um, you know, sort of where are the kind of temporal lines of like water rise um, coming through this, and how does that um, relationship then? Uh, play out in terms of, you know, what are spaces for humans during some parts of the day, but spaces for um, sea life and other creatures at other parts of the day. And um, so I, I think it, it, it might just be that something that's in your head and hasn't kind of come forward representational, uh, representationally. Um, so, you know, I think that, that like a moment, like we've zoomed out and then sort of seeing where where water is, where flow is, um, you know, and then maybe a kind of stronger articulation about um, who are our, our co-species in, in this environment. Uh, are these you know, seagulls um, that I think things could get pretty dark on those interiors with, you know, roosting seagulls and seals, or um, are we thinking about, you know, sea anemones uh, during, and slimes uh, during certain times of the day? Um, just, just as a kind of a very detailed moment, um, which, which sort of sets the tone, but also kind of sets uh, programmatic and temporal actions within the building. I'm glad you brought the, the tidal aspect up. I mean, that, that's why the base is so extruded, um, to allow that to, to come in and leave as it saw fit almost. And, and to answer your question about which species I was envisioning here, um, a large part of my uh, research was around um, the kelp aquaculture that's going on around Ventura and how it's supporting the local mussel um, ecosystem actually as well. So it's meant to function almost exactly like you said as a reef where, where um, more passive uh, life forms can, can grow onto and, and take hold. Oh, would, lo would love to see some, some, some of these surfaces starting to drip with mussels. That'd be really mm -hmm. awesome. But it's so vertical. I mean, when I when I think about the when I think about I, I I think Mimi's exactly right. This like the literal condition, the sort of edge condition of sort of like what is between the water and the land, and the sort of the tr the transition between those two um, uh, conditions. This this is almost there's a piece of this that almost seems like it's trying to rise so far above it and to escape from that watery grave down below, <laughs> or or there's the sense that it'd be, if this was like entirely submerged, right? Or if there was much more that was sort of underwater. And so there's there different levels of, of, um, of, of habitation by different types of, of sea life and others. And the space that is sort of comfortable for humans to occupy in water down to 30 feet or, you know, or 10 meters or so. And then above that, and then you know what that looks like once you are 10, 15, 20 stories above it, right? I mean, the sort of like the very different living conditions, but it just, it's that thing seems so vertical to me that it that it began to escape that the um, 
the interesting proposition of of using the water line and the and the these this sort of different set of vertical conditions as a as the as the most dynamic uh, a set of activities that would be happening in the space. Um, that's but that's my only sort of like how did it get so vertical? How did it like, how did just th like, this is this like cathedral, like, you know, shooting up into the sky is just sort of, you know, getting, getting so far away from the water. I think um, to answer your question, uh, I, I started actually trying to articulate the landscape as the project and just regrading everything almost um, similar to Helena's strategy with the terracing. Um, and it felt like it needed a single point of departure from that for people to actually inhabit. Um, and the project overall was more of an exercise in understanding how um, changing the scale of primitive forms using the same algorithm to aggregate um, could create these two different spaces. And I became interested in how, when I directed them to behave in a way that I thought was more conducive to human use, um, they became hyper vertical. And when I um, changed my, uh, my tweaking of the inputs to the algorithm to accommodate what I thought would be better for um, sea life, uh, it became much more horizontal. So I actually wanted to highlight that contrast in the project, um, but it sounds like I need to resolve the two a little bit more clearly. Things. Yeah, yeah, I think it, it, it is super interesting. Just something, and not that, and not that verticality can't be, uh, can't have a sort of productive relationship to this. I, I, as I was watching this, I was reminded. Sorry if this is like every time I'm going to come up with like some sort of short book book review or book comment, but uh, there's a not as greatest, but a very good novel by uh, Kim Stanley Robinson called New York 2140. Uh, which is all about, it takes place in New York City that's been flooded by um, one of the big sea level rises. And a lot of that book is about the kind of architectural conditions and spatial conditions that obtain in New York City, which he calls the Super Venice. Um, now that all the streets have been flooded up to, I think like 34th Street or something like that. Um, and that, that zone of, of flooding where it finally goes on to dry land is like the next big zone of speculative capital development and everything else. And so there's a whole, there's a whole discussion of speculation and capital and, and blockchain and uh, digital currencies and everything going on in that. Um, but it, it, you know, as, I was, as I was listening to your narrative and watching this, I was thinking that and wondering, looking at the comparison and contrast. So that might be something worth checking out for you. For the next like, yeah, we're gonna go start reading. We have time now. So. <laughs> uh, Philippe, I'll, I'll jump in. I mean, I, I think you've made something fantastic. I mean, I, I think there's, a, there's maybe like a, there is like a bit of a, uh, there is ambition of the project which you had all along. And I think it actually kind of is more perceptible and more maybe clear as it was said on the, on the ground, you know, the sort of landscape of the ground and the way it actually kind of like builds its own sort of like a, a sort of underworld and underwater kind of a, a reef sort of foundation. I think that's beautiful. And then the towers, I, I just find them kind of amazing as a sort of spatial proposition and aesthetic one as well. It's like if like it's Frank Lloyd Wright and, and, and Paul Rudolph had sort of made a project together and, you know, had this, I mean, I just, I can't keep, you know, I can keep away from the sort of like, almost like corduroy concrete that you made, you know, which is like, it's not corduroy, it's like slightly rotated, like uh, planks. I mean, it's like, I want to go and, and actually like cast that thing. And I mean, I think there is like, every time I, I mean, I, I know you, I know you think of it this way and uh, as a sort of a result of a technical thing, even though you actually have, a, have an eye and hand to do that. But you made something that is not just a result of a, you know, of a set of technical things, of a technical operations. You certainly made something which is, you know, above and beyond that. I mean, both sort of formally at the level of volume and masses, but also at the level of the of the sort of surface conditions of that, you know, the kind of aesthetics. Uh, I mean, on symmetry apart and so on. So I, I don't know. I mean, I think uh, again, I think all of it it's within the kind of a sphere or world making of your project. Uh, they're not maybe completely together, let's say, you know, but they could be together. They certainly are together. Uh, but I would say, I think it's important to, to, to reflect back in terms of what you have made. I mean, it's so-called cathedral. I think that space is, is really kind of sublime, you know, for some reason it's also kind of remind me of Game of Thrones when I see this sort of like, it looks like some sort of kind of a, a symbol, you know, of a, either the church or some sort of crusade. 
I mean, it's like a kind of a medieval thing in some sort. So, I mean, whatever that is, you know, whatever that is in the context of what you're interested in, um, I think you deserve a lot of credit for that, you know. And uh, but I will, I will, I think it's important that you don't keep kind of repeating the sort of diatribe of like, how do you make it, you know, or like, how what was the tools and so on, which certainly you use that. Uh, but that's not what made it, you know, you, you made it, let's say, you made it by actually having something, you know, following some kind of uh, credo uh, that produced some of those sort of fantastic spaces and, 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 you know, and corners and details. It means a lot to hear. Yeah, I mean, I, um, just to kind of uh, follow that up, um, yeah, it's interesting, like, there, there's so much, uh, Kind of sensibility here and uh, finesse um, to kind of hear it being described as um, just a I don't know just outcome of script algorithm script algorithm at, at some level I think the um, what you've been able to maybe uh, figure out here is to have an agency over the protocol that you're engaging uh, that allows your subjectivity to come to the front. And I think uh, maybe there are points that uh, that it does that too much. Like there's insistence on the kind of scripted play out at every scale at, uh, at a high intensity. And you can kind of see when it works and when it doesn't work. Uh, I, I think Tom brought it up earlier. When you actually see that, um, when you see the atrium, it's like quite beautiful. The bottom is beautiful looking up like this scene is incredible. Um, but then you, you go see the railing and the person at the scale of human. Uh, it, it's kind of almost fetishizes uh, the tool uh, at a level that it doesn't need to do. I, I think projects like this where um, certain things are operational and successful at certain scales don't necessarily operate at every scale with the same intensity, uh, bringing in other elements, bringing in other normal things to push against the um, kind of exotic nature of what you already produced at another scale could actually serve you well. Because I think it's in the moments uh, of those tensions uh, that projects become more interesting and begin to break the mold of uh, how they're made. Because once that becomes more intentional, you don't have to justify the project with how it's made. The other thing, maybe another kind of fetish here, and I think I'm going to try to tie it back to Mimi's um, uh, earlier comments about specific instances. Perhaps it was a requirement, perhaps it's the necessity to kind of um, represent the project, um, you know, through the animation. Uh, the insistence on the fly through and moving camera um, can be put into question where kind of really focus on certain moments that are critical uh, to your argument in terms of how non-human inhabit this, how some particular moments allow us to inhabit that world, that suggestion, how to understand in a kind of tactile manner, material manner, environmental manner, that uh, representation of that moment becomes far more intentional, far more specific so that you can um, kind of uh, let us kind of really feel, right, uh, your intentions. I think, you know, uh, it's operating um, as, as kind of amazing as it is the project, it operates in its representation uh, as a flat line, like you're always seeing the same thing as you fly through. Um, and there could be moments of how we abstract or how we kind of become far more literal materially, atmospherically, uh, to uh, kind of generate other effects, more specific effects to uh, convey this condition of human, non-human collaboration, coexistence. Um, and finally, I think what you're making at the end is kind of a new geography, new terrain. Uh, and with every new terrain comes new forms of occupation. Um, to, um, to imagine just housing and fish habitats right at the bottom of this is probably not enough or um, it is the beginning of something uh, to, and to speculate all the other potentials that might develop um, in this ecology, uh, whether tall atriums, whether um, kind of growth towers, etc., whatever they might be. I think those require uh, 
kind of a serious look in terms of uh, what other potentials might be possible uh, within this new uh, new geography. But a fantastic project. Well, thank you for all the, the comments and feedback. Great. Um, are there any uh, any last comments for this project? That might be a good place to uh, move on to the next one. It was always good to end on a positive sentence, right? All right. All right. Great job, uh, Philippe. Um, so next we have uh, Jai Shri. Teresa. Hello, everyone. Let me share my screen real quick. Hello everyone, my name is Jayshri Vartani Jawahar and I present to you my thesis, Project Oasis. The primary focus was to study the various conditions in the architecture above, below and at the ground conditions. Living in a small space is a growing trend of our days. All over the world, more and more people are making their choice to live in a dwelling with modest proportions. This already exists in cities like Jaipur, Jodhpur, Cairo, etc. Because of the lack of space, these small compartment housing also serves as multi-purpose dwellings. Roofs were used as recreational spaces. This seemed like an aggregate itself above the ground. The ground conditions in ancient Egyptian architecture emphasized on large openings to underground habitations. Having a similar methodology of habitation, the underground dwellings, the rocket cave architecture, was also helpful in understanding the water storage techniques underground, which was similar across all these precedents. The step wells of India, Roman baths and cisterns were studied and the combination of all three of them helped generate plants using cycle gang. This serves as a wellness center in the project as well as help to store water for the incorporated aeroponics technology. This site is Desert Hot Springs in California located within the Coachella Valley, known for its naturally occurring hot and cold mineral springs. The idea behind generating the plants is to form a spatial relationship between the three ground conditions, to interlink technology with site-specific programs and to form an interdependent part-to-hold relationship of the programs and technology. The assembly of modules was to have a combination of terraces and housing modules when no two assemblies are the same. The variation helped to form a nuanced plan. The spatial arrangement follows the contours to create natural, more systematic and logical ground conditions across the site. The ground connects the modules above and below the ground to form a holistic relationship across the project. The programs in these three ground conditions are interdependent on each other to form a complete circle. As we move underground, the wellness center comprises of baths for the residents and also plays a vital role in aeroponics by storing and pumping water to cater to the needs of the residents. Circulation here is mainly through step wells and stairways. The plunge pool spaces are grown vaulted with unobstructed views that allow men and women to socialize exercise and bathe. As the weather is primarily hot, solar panels are installed on the terrace modules to help heat the calderium, also known as the hot pools. The plunge pools, the heated pools and the step wells are all interconnected for easy access of the users. Private baths have partition walls for added privacy. The Hindu Islamic step well system is incorporated in the bath as a more recreational public space. Light wells from the punctures at the ground level help in bringing more natural light to the underground spaces. These step wells serve as circulation as well as relaxation space in the wellness center. As we move above ground, the housing modules underground are intended to blend across the site conditions to create a blur at the edges and form a part to hold relationship. The terraces of the housing modules house aeroponic technology, primarily private terraces of the residence unit. 
The panels hovering above the green absorb solar heat for the pools below the ground and also as a shelter for the plants. Each unit is customized according to the residents' needs and priorities, where technology plays a vital role in connecting the terraces across the site. There are pocket spaces at ground levels which cater to the public and multi-purpose spaces for the residents. Every unit is strategically placed in such a way that they get an unobstructed view of the mountains on the site. The interior spaces are temperature-controlled environments given the hot and dry climate conditions of the site. Every unit has an overlooking aeroponic terrace which is completely controlled and modified by the residents. Every house is designed to have a full panoramic view of the mountains and or both the lush green terraces from the modules. The spaces are effectively used to serve their needs. This thesis focuses on exploring various ground conditions and a smart design strategy and advanced technologies that make such compact housing spaces feel spacious enough for living by implementing aggregative architecture discrete material assemblies, combinatorial ontologies, and their possible upscaling and implications on urban design. Thank you. So this one's with all the audios we can talk about. project begins with this ambiguity towards what's a ground um, and things like if I'm understanding correctly things like roofs and streets kind of become the same thing like this you know very ancient city Chattahoyuk where the aggregation of walls and spaces um, didn't allow for actual streets where the street kind of got subsumed to the form in a way mm -hmm. so I really think that detachment is interesting and then at the same time your project in at least in this um, narrative imagery that you produce, there is a strong attachment to the ground because the ground gets reified through the separation between below ground and above ground. And I was thinking it would be um, maybe more reinforcing of your initial thesis if that separation wasn't so distinct. Um, I don't know if that made sense what I'm saying without the image, without being able to point to the exact image you're producing, but. Um, even the color of the things that are below, below, below ground and above ground begins to code and codify that separation. And I don't, I think that's really not necessary. Um, and then I'm, th because you're the third project we've seen and I'm really new to, um, I'm not new to the SciArc faculty, but I'm sort of new to these particular studio um, series, there's this interesting thing that keeps happening with the past few projects also, which is this question of materiality within the buildings and this kind of um, um, like there's a kind of matterlessness to the form um, and material sort of alluded to, but it's not really, um, and, and you know, all this to say, of course, it's not necessary that it needs to be a material project, but there's like these moments where like you kind of know there's a material sensibility and then other moments where matter and form conflate, you know, like the matter is the form, form is the matter. Um, and I was just wondering if like these procedures of scripting, um, you know, it's just interesting to think about how these procedures begin to um, force you to um, push back the questions of matter and material um, which then get brought back into the project, but maybe not brought back with um, as much um, um, potential um, intelligence and interpretation as is possible. Um, so I feel like matter and materiality is being um, applied like paint aesthetically in this really beautiful way. Like I would love, you know, this project is really wonderful. Um, and yet I also really want there to be a proposition about um, when does, when do you, when does matter come into play um, as a kind of, um, sorry, phone call, uh, sorry, moment in the project. Uh, 
I've lost all of you because somebody has called me. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, those are my first initial thoughts. But really, uh, really well, well produced. Thank you for that. Is um, you were, Jesser, you were talking about um, there's the below ground, which is the kind mm -hmm. of lifestyle spa, um, and then there's the above ground, which has the aeroponics, um, is and the I guess housing. Um, is there, I, I guess, I, I can you talk? I'm not, I'm not saying this right. I feel like this project could use um, a third programmatic component, which may be the aeroponics, um, to begin to sort of interlink these systems together. Um, so could you talk a little bit more about the kind of use of the aeroponic gardening and how you see that sort of integrated uh, with the with both the kind of spa, the spa below and the housing above? Yeah. So the main idea behind this was to create temperature controlled environments, like given the site conditions. So uh, the underground area, which acts as a wellness center, which also helps in storing water and help pumping water to the aeroponics modules. So all of these programs are interconnected and dependent on each other. Uh, can we just like maybe decide that this isn't like aeroponics and blurring growing flowers, but given that Desert Hot Springs is like the number one spot for growing uh, marijuana, like this could be like a, a cannabis <laughs> farm. Like I, I just want to give like one more sort of really like hard um, sort of programmatic element to it. And I think uh, general aeroponics doesn't doesn't quite do that. And I think that you actually could um, sort of kind of close the loop on this kind of lifestyle spa relaxation sort of commerce uh, moment that is actually happening out there in uh, Desert Hot Springs. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm going to start. I don't know where it's going to go, um, but uh, you know, it's interesting. I, I was having a really good time watching your video. Um, Thank you. It's like super relaxing music, um, kind of just like the total mood of the project somehow conveyed in the way you spoke. Um, and at first I was like, oh, this is like almost too commercial. Uh, but then, you know, okay, like that's not fair because at some level we all engage, you know, modes of representations that at some level become generic and becomes uh, conventions that we all engage at some point in our careers. Um, and I, I have seen my part of these kinds of videos. I participated in them, made them, um, and I have seen them uh, be hidden from certain audiences uh, in the practices that I worked for. Um, but in, at some level, everybody does them. And uh, that is not to say this is a commercial video, but I think there's something super smart happening here uh, because you fully embrace, um, you know, the, the, that kind of quality. And in, in my opinion, there's kind of quite a bit of humor in this, or at least it amused me to a level that um, I'm, I'm, I'm taking it super seriously. And uh, I kind of appreciate it kind of, candid approach in terms of uh, what it is, what it wants to be, what it aspires to be. Um, and uh, I think within every convention, uh, there is something to uh, something to toy with and something to uh, maybe problematize. Um, and, you know, I kind of agree on some uh, straightforward uh, architectural comments. What was striking for me is that very clear uh, delineation between what's above ground and what's below ground. And um, the interesting thing about all the precedents that you called for, um, you know, a lot of them, uh, Cappadocia, et cetera, are from places I'm from. And um, the, you know, the, you lose that sense of uh, datum completely in those environments. There is no above, there is no below. 
um, certain things that kind of take you down and up. Uh, you think you're underground and all of a sudden you look out from a carved aperture, you realize you're like 200 meters above another part. It's kind of full of uh, surprises in the way uh, these precedents operate. Um, and I think in your case that uh, kind of uh, lower and upper are perhaps too clear cut uh, as a new typology and uh, kind of fall prey to perhaps a little bit of architectural organization that deal with uh, established hierarchies. And if that could be put into some kind of tension, so we lose that, uh, I think uh, that could be done through sectional variation when you're in the pool environments, perhaps as a moment of chimneys, tall spaces, it could cut through the messes that are above the ground. So that kind of once uh, kind of uh, spatial uh, perception when underground uh, could yield to uh, uh, incredible expansion sectionally, uh, could be kind of super interesting. You do that in some way moving down in the section uh, as the staircases descend into the pools, but it never goes up breaking the datum between uh, what's above and what's below. Um, but, um, you know, kind of uh, that, that, that that keeps coming back to me. There is something in the way how you presented this, um, like has everything to do with a commercial kind of um, video, but then you start talking about uh, thesis in that. And that somehow aesthetic disjunction for me is super interesting. And I think Mimi's suggestion of bringing in, you know, what was obviously missing here, uh, could actually kind of propel it even further. Like you can begin to get kind of more political. You can begin to get just far more active in the way uh, how you speak the tone, speak through the tone that you're speaking um, to kind of uh, charge the project. Um, I think that that to me was a risk to take in the project. And like, to me, it completely played out. Thank you for that. So the, uh, I I agree with you, Buchanan. To me, I don't know if someone said this already, I stepped out for one second, but the, the, there's something that feels to me very pandemic-y about this. It's like no place, nowhere. There are kind of memories of architecture throughout, you know, colonnades and arches and spas and pools and stairs, sort of like vague memories, almost like the pandemic has been here so long that that the, this is what remains and this is how we start to design our architecture around these vague memories and it's very weird and i love the choice of these these totally weird scale figures that are all on the phone like all the time and the way they're pacing it's like literally the pandemic has been going for 75 years <laughs> this is the new state of reality and it's like i read this whole thing more like a giant stage set and i just kind of believe you about the the architectural design i don't know i can't be more specific than it than it would be like the the um the architecture of of vague memory of architecture and uh and i find that totally weird and kind of disconcerting and and also awesome and sci-fi and 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 everything so so there's but i but like just uh, so, and very timely, of course, but I I'm just noticing more and more the choice of the scale figure, particularly now that they're animated, is becoming really important because it, it connects us back to the subject in a really real way. The subject is no longer, a, a, you know, a, a little model or a, either high res or low res or just a scale figure or whatever. Suddenly the figures are animated and you start to automatically in your mind build a narrative when they move a certain way, when they move in human-like ways. And, and the way you brought, I've never seen this before where they're like doing that weird pacing thing that everyone actually does in airports or whatever. Uh, um, I think that's gonna become really important for architecture coming up, you know, like, like as we, as many people wanna talk more about identity and the subject and other issues to actually deal with that live in the way that we represent um, uh, the subject in, in architecture. Thank you for that. <laughs> you know, in this, era, in this particular moment, 
when bodies become really important, including who's occupying what kind of body um, and what bodies are being shown, um, you have a lot of specific types of bodies. And there's a whole project in different practices right now that um, is interested in designing the bodies of human scale figures, you know, as much as they are interested in designing the environment that the bodies occupy. And so I think um, in a project which about pools and showcasing bodies and what bodies belong and how many different kinds of bodies can exist in spaces, um, that seems like a particularly um, important site you should attend to carefully, um, you know, and while thinking about along these lines of bodies and ability, um, then I'm also, it, it's such a, it's not a helpful point, but you know, you're like, well, you're not going to see a disabled body because there's so many freaking stairs in your project. Mm -hmm. um, and it just seems like there'd be nice moments where it doesn't have to be a whole project for you, right? Like it doesn't have to be about, um, you know, it depends on your own politics and your own envision of your own practice. But um, it, it seems like if you want to be an architect responsive to a particular moment, whatever your politics, you do want to know like what is the um, climate we're in right now and think about that as things you allude to or things you point to in your project um, with some care and attention. I can't stop thinking about the time machine, uh, the 1960s movie based on the HG Wells and that like all of these, everything's happening underground. And these are like the 21st or 22nd century Morlocks that are inhabiting this underground world. And you know, you, the, the, the people upstairs are hiding <laughs> in their, in their, in these interiors. Um, there's, there's something, there's something, Something has to take a second step here. The, uh, you know, the, 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 the suggestion of these spaces are, are quite astounding. Um, but the sort of, the, the piece of me here too is thinking there's sort of this a really, aside from just the fact that it's in the desert and it's going to be hot and thus there needs to be pools and cooling, the sort of the, the, the conversation or the thought around the sun and shade and how that operates seems seems a little under theorized um, or under considered at least at this point for my mind in terms of what this place looks like. Um, but there there is something totally fantastic about it, and and uh, and the sort of the 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 ready the almost the like ready to build nature, um, or that some of these scenes could be straight out of a of a kind of a vacation home catalog. Um, doesn't doesn't detract from that. There's a kind of uh, extraordinary quality to it, but I think that there's a there's a step or two that needs to be taken next. I agree with it too. Okay. Uh, so, um, I mean, it's beautiful, Jason. So, um, I mean, I think there's like a, I mean, talking about world making, this is really a, a world you have created here, um, <laughs> above ground and underground. And, uh, you know, maybe, I don't know, I think the, there are differences. I, I don't know. I'm, for, for me, I think that the, the, the the approach is at its best when it actually seen from above. It seems like you know in the kind of horizon line of the mountains and the desert, and and somehow like its sort of limits uh, disappear into the edges, and you know which is sort of the references of some of the the you know the kind of tombs and uh, of the Saudi Arabian Peninsula or some of the or some of the examples you were showing, and maybe the way hits the ground the way it deals with the kind of datum of the of, of the of let's say the zero it's maybe kind of questionable and 
but I think it actually produces super, super interesting moments, spaces, actual rooms, you know, in, in, in all of that, which are super interesting. And the more as you, as you sort of break down scale, you get into this super interesting kind of pergola or like semi cover shaded spaces or outdoor bedrooms and so on, which are, I mean, it's, it is, I mean, it was mentioned, it is kind of a sort of poster child for probably, a, you know, some sort of amazing, Probably more hotel than 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 uh, you know than than uh, housing, but maybe housing, um, you know, to kind of want to be in. So I think you've kind of done a, a terrific job at that, and I think that's if, if there's some some level of speculation is some sort of a trend to try and follow and produce a sense of desire. I think you certainly have succeeded on that. So uh, yeah, I mean, great job. Thank you. Thanks for that, Marcelo. Great. Right, um, so if there are no further comments, um, we'll move on to the final project for this afternoon um, for Tucker. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yep. Am I coming through clear? Great. Okay. Hello, my name is Tucker Van Leeuwenhall and I will be presenting my project Deep Plan. Corbusier stated that a house is a machine for living. In other words, an assortment of function, forms, and technology, a never ending changing and reordering of priorities and standards. This project is an attempt to order a new type of domestic life. It will address issues of density, agriculture, and mass transit. The project is located in Los Angeles, a city where the battleground for domestic bliss has raged for a century now and is entering into a new threshold of change. The site is considerably large, emblematic of the suburban horizontal nature of the city. Located south of LAX and just east of the ocean, it is a constrained and less leftover parcel of land abutted on all sides by railroad tracks and swaths of industry. As for most of Los Angeles, this area lacks any considerable identity. The ubiquitous single family home plows over much of the surrounding area wherever industry and commercial venues have not taken hold. It is a fuzzy aggregate. Neighborhoods are cut short from one another, whereas at other times they bleed into neighboring streets. The suburban sprawl enables both of these conditions. This trop project will try to replicate this. To confront issues of density and to uh, counter domestic sprawl, this project looks to expand on the typology of a deep plan to speak to the domestic lifestyle of the single family home, but one that is denser, more compact, stacked. Cues are taken from other projects that have attempted to densify and reorient domesticity. The unit de habitation by Corbusier is raised from the site, eliminating any semblance of a plinth and attempts to create heterogeneity in an otherwise overtly homogeneous massing by the fenestration and detailing of the facade. Robin Hood Gardens by the Smithsons transfers the urban street into the circulation quarters of the building. By doing so, it creates two floors that are solely dedicated to inhabitation, whereas the, le left, the, lever, the level that sits between is dedicated to circulation and gives access through the unit through a vertical stair. The Barbican holds a site that is contorted and irregular. It straddles trains lines and breaches city blocks. It similarly hovers above the ground in sight and offsets a compact and dense layout by puncturing green swaths of park and vegetation. King's Cross Station is a large complex spread out. The site carries varied mixed use buildings while hosting the majority of the infrastructure behind buildings that act independently of the stations. This compact and densely orchestrated area serves as an example for the normal scale and mixed use. The formal logic of these sites are adapted in the project. The overall site is removed, opening a large tank in which a transfer transportation hub can operate. The plinth is raised above the ground and staggered to adapt to the topology. Podiums are inserted at an interval that makes egress ADA compliant while leaving as much of the land below open. The podiums and plants are then formed into a massing that attempts to eliminate a homogeneous massing. Cues are taken from the Smithson's plan for Berlin where the city block is turned into an individual building. Each building consists of up to three podiums that hold up the plinth. The building is then made porous by subtracting an aggregate of abstract forms. What emerges is a fuzzy aggregate, not through the fuzziness or unreadability of the silhouettes, but rather the tectonic fenestration of the mass. This porousness enables new multiple possibilities. The vertical shafts allow ambient light to pour into the massing and ground below. In addition, they provide a passive manner in which to circulate the air in the units. 
The horizontal shafts allow for horizontal circulation between apartments. The openness and fenestration of the cuts enable plant and agricultural growth. And the cuts from the vertical courtyards mean that every apartment has privacy and adequate exposure to light. As opposed to direct light, this project prioritizes ambient light, allowing for the project to be more dense. The massing is retrofitted table enable occupation. The massing is broken down into five by five by four meter components that are then used to aggregate. Each component is 3D printed out of a ceramic material, both for the thermodynamic properties inherent in the material, as well as to serve for the substrate onto which the plant life can thrive. The components are then retrofitted with glazing. The glazing was created using a cycle GAN that, um, that was then used as both ornamental motif as, but more importantly, helps inform the placement of vegetation. These components are assembled into large urban chunks that are all served by the core that occupies the center of the chunk. This serves as a new component, which is then aggregated across the overall massing and clipped as necessary. The diagrammatic layout of Robin Hood Gardens is used where the street layer is open and serves only horizontal circulation and two layers above and below are given to apartments. The entrances to apartments lead to staircase that bring the occupant to their living space. In these two layers, there's another horizontal circulation that gives access to apartments without the need of vertical circulation. Each apartment has access to at least one private courtyard. Some apartments have up to two to three. As all the components are prefabricated, they can be oriented in whichever way they need to in order to provide the, the flexibility to make as many varied apartment layouts as needed. In order to reduce the ecological footprint made by humans, it is necessary to consolidate as much program in use as possible. Agriculture, which has most always been allocated to the outskirts of cities, finds a new home on the terracotta facade of the building. The passive water system is used within the walls to water the plants, a more eff efficient way to grow agriculture as water cannot evaporate and the plants cannot be overwatered. Machines on the surface of the project harvest crops when they are grown and plant seeds for the next harvest. The plants help insulate the project that is necessary that the thermal dam um, as it increases the thermal mass of the walls, as well as helps to clean the air around the site through photosynthesis. What emerges is a new kind of typology, that of a functioning deep plan, an urban consolidation of users and programs that are hoisted from the ground, a project that creates a large amount of housing and also creates new farmland to help offset the cost of the project as well as the occupant's environmental footprint. An oddly heterogeneous project that could in theory have an infinite amount of apartment layouts while all being rapidly produced and retrofitted through its prefabricated construction. It is time to create more housing and it is time to consolidate our global footprint. Los Angeles, like many cities, is getting hotter, ever more stripped of resources and access to the necessities for life and has a housing problem that needs to be addressed. This project is an answer to that call, one that both provides answers as well as um, raises new questions. What is domesticity? What is a deep plan? And what is the future of housing? The video has some more length to it, so we'll just keep going. Tucker, what is the domesticity? What is your domestic proposal. I feel like a lot of your presentation, which, you know, the project is again, so beautifully executed. So much, so much of it leaned on referencing of external sources and case studies that it almost offset some authority to these projects. And um, kind of similarly, you know, a lot of solutions were uh, outsourced to systems that were not necessarily part of your authorship. So prefabrication, urban gardens, these became like really, um, um, I don't, you know, and I don't want you to take, a f I want you to bring out your project a bit more, but it becomes kind of a generic utopia because you've outsourced the tension a bit, right? Or you, you've outsourced to other systems. I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more um, without necessarily having to allude to like external authorities, um, what, what you want to, what you're trying to propose deeply in your deep plan, um, the kind of domestic configuration or urban proposition or um, the bigness of the, the scale of the work itself? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I think it was important to uh, backdrop the project amongst other mass transit or um, ma massive housing projects um, to kind of give it more air and context. Um, but I think the, I guess it would be important to specify how it's different than those. And I think what's different is that um, 
there's not this separation between nature and um, building. And all of the examples from the post-war period, um, the buildings were either drenched into the ground or lifted off and the, uh, ac the uh, leftover land was left to park space. And in this project, what I wanted to do was make that line a little fuzzier, both to speak to fuzzy aggregate um, discussion in terms of not only the massing qualities of a fuzzy aggregate, but the actual linear um, demarcation of the differentiation between nature and man. Um, and I wanted to bring that, that out. And in terms of the domesticity issue, I think it's, it's frankly just how we live and how um, we need to consolidate our global footprint in order to be able to live in um, a more sustainable manner, not in, not in the necessarily uh, generic sustainability, but like really going in hard and trying to figure out how we can really densify these cities and areas and make them um, retrofit to be able to inhabit people. Um, I didn't mention, but this project can fit up to 500 people per square acre, um, if not more, if it was made larger, which is um, more housing than all the precedents um, that were mentioned before. Um, the, and the farmland embedded in the structure, like a, a, just this is just a thought about how sort of the idea of metrics might actually be a driver uh, on this project rather than a kind of uh, utopian vision for how we should live um, that, you know, can, can you sort of think about, you know, how much tonnage um, of produce is being produced by the housing complex um, mm -hmm. versus how much consumption, right? Like, is this a self, not sustainable in, as you said, in the kind of greenwash sustainable way, but, you know, is this indeed a closed loop system where the, you know, this is a huge project. Um, it, you're basically sort of doing a kind of an, a, a, a town, right? And this is it, within this, you know, this could be here in El Segundo, this could be on Mars, right? It's a, um, there's a way that you could start to talk about it through the kind of productive landscape of the building itself. Um, and that is about how you sort of craft your narrative, um, but also how you craft renderings like this, right? pansies unless you're um, you know in a fancy restaurant eating salads or something like you don't see a lot of pansies for consumption but you know as the pandemic has taught us like people are experimenting with victory gardens um, and other ways of sort of feeding themselves from their own sort of uh, garden spaces right so how how can a building like this um, be at sort of the most productive agriculturally? Part of that might also be um, then limiting the height, right? Like, you know, can we look at where the the shadow lines are? Where, you know, what is the absolute reach of light into the cores of these buildings? Um, are north sides as productive as south sides? Um, you know, all of these things I think could start to add parameters for the shaping um, of the building that um, that could really add to the kind of argumentation of it. And I think this whole, you know, I think you starting out with this idea that of like um, your one proposition was nature meets urban, I suppose, but the, you know, specifically around agriculture, agriculture is not nature, it's technology at this point, mm -hmm. right? So this idea of um, post, post natural, which is I think what you're going for, um, makes a lot of sense with agriculture, but being really specific with your terms, recognizing mm -hmm. that nature having had this romanticized ideal about it. Maybe that is not the term you're thinking through. And, you know, you're just being like a little bit more, you know, you seem like a very careful thinker. And I really appreciate um, that, you know, when asked, you're able to articulate your intentions very clearly. But if, if you know, if agriculture, if nature is, nature as agriculture is therefore technology, then I would start to be designing, as Mimi's saying, like start to be designing with um, these kinds of natural, um, systems as much as you begin designing your, you know, your um, material, physical, you know, technic systems as, you know, alongside one another and, and being able to point to that as part of your process, mm -hmm. uh, right? Yeah, no, that's a great point. And I, I wanted to touch on the 
um, difference between agriculture and nature, which I think is a really fascinating one. Um, I, I, I in no means wanted to romanticize um, a, nat a nature aesthetic, but I wanted to try to figure out a way to turn agriculture into something, um, perhaps it's more contemporary, something that's has more of an aesthetic assertion as opposed to just a technologic or functional assertion to it. Um, and so that was kind of the blurring that I wanted to reach between what's known as nature or the romanticization of nature and agriculture. And being able to put that on a building kind of requires this, um, this slippage between those terms so that the, the agriculture can become aestheticized and can take on a new kind of um, formal logic aside from what it is now. I was just thinking about um, how Tim Morton always talks about nature and his big problem with the way with even that word is that it always seems to kind of assume that nature is out there somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and his argument is that it's actually inside of us um, in so many ways, whether it's parasites living within us or, you know, or all the other ways that nature is us, but is inside us. And I, I like that. Um, I guess I like the project the most when it seems like the natural elements are really deeply embedded in these blocks and it seems to be a feature of the blocks almost. Mm -hmm. um, there, are, there are some scenes, this is, this is interesting, it feels like that, but there are some scenes when it feels like applique. Um, some of the interior views where there are like flowers kind of growing out of walls in all different directions and um, almost like it's been painted on or something. And I think that's, that's less, uh, less convincing. Um, uh, but, but I get what you're after. I think though, also, I would just add that, that when I look like at this elevation or at other things, there's a lot going on here that isn't just about the kind of bigger idea of nature um, and, and housing. There's like giant monolithic architecture with lots of tiny little articulated apertures in it. And the, I think that the sense of the, of, of the monolithic is a non-obvious answer to what you're talking about, if you know what I mean. Like, like you might be in a different architect with the same, the same position showing us a landscape project and that might seem the natural way to like deal with something like this. So, so I guess I, I appreciate that you're willing to go there with a, with a building, a formal type, not, a, not even a functional type, but a formal type that uh, seems so anathema to what we consider to be sort of something appropriate to nature. Uh, and, I, and I think that's something that we really do as a, as a, um, as a field need to work on more. And um, I, th I think, as I mentioned in an earlier review today, that I think the more we do it in a non-sentimental way, the more we're gonna make headway with this, mm -hmm. with this subject. And I think your non-sentimental approach seems, I don't know, it, it's, it's attractive to me and I appreciate that you're working on it. So um, yeah, so great job. Thank you. No, I, I, I quite enjoyed the, uh... You know the entire presentation i mean especially this scene where you finally come to kind of these messing ambiguous messings um their monolithic quality the articulation on the surfaces then eroding of the mass through the fine aperture um and you know i think there's quite a bit of skill and sensibility um in the project um and i think the discussions uh, that are coming are and kind of really crucial and important to unpack because um, what, what the project left me is not uh, something that aspires to define a new nature necessarily, but almost in the operates for me more in the realm of aesthetics, which I could relate to um, an Instagram account that I contemplate quite a bit called Abandoned Earth, um, where there's this imagery of like abandoned things and your final imagery, and I gotta say, like, it's exquisite, it's compelling, it's beautiful, atmospheric, it has all the kind of qualities that invites one in uh, to kind of indulge in their curiosity, um, point me to a very familiar aesthetic. Um, 
And I'm wondering uh, whether when you set up this problem that you would end up there or this is how you ended up, whether this was you know, out of control at some level where um, the degree of overtake by the organic ma uh, matter in the project uh, kind of pushed in that direction. Because I think I, I find myself agreeing with Tom um, the project for me is far more ambiguous in its nature as architecture, as infrastructure, or as something that oscillates between the two. Uh, when the organic matter just bursts, bursts through the cracks, uh, especially in the vertical planes, I think there is a moment in your um, animation that's uh, kind of clearly visible um, where it's harder to locate the project uh, as anything. Yeah, these images that we're moving through, either kind of coming through the openings in the um, kind of top surfaces or the uh, vertical ones. But the, the the moment it begins to kind of cover everything, right, it begin, begins to become uh, this um, kind of uh, consumption of uh, consuming of the organic matter over the project. Um, I think it, it, it becomes more familiar and it, it's kind of odd, right? Like you push something to an extreme and then it becomes familiar because it, it just became uh, something that looks like nature. But mm -hmm. that moment that you have in between where it's kind of hard to position, where it's hard to put in one bracket, seems to be a far more provocative moment in the project. And I think as you kind of, um, you know, as you kind of advance in your, um, in your um, quest here, to be able to dial up and down and find that position, find it in between positions always, um, could be kind of far more interesting than pushing to kind of obviously a radical end because that end might at the end uh, kind of water down the ambitions of the project. Like this moment, actually, we were just looking at in addition to this, to me are the more, more interesting moments where there's tension between kind of the familiar uh, and the extreme, where you cannot really position it in one or the other. Yeah, um, I totally understand what you're saying. I think um, I've had the pleasure like of seeing... Like this is killer, like right here. You know what I mean? Like then it gets covered with everything. You can no longer read anything. And I mm. think that tension is super crucial for you. Mm -hmm. But go ahead. Sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. No, no worries. Um, yeah, I've just, I, I was saying that I've had the pleasure of being able to study at SIRED for the last six years. Um, and I've become very accustomed to be able to digest um, images and content that's um, hard to digest, I guess. I don't know how else to put it. Um, something that if I were to show to somebody on the street who is not familiar with an architectural discourse would not understand what's going on or it's relevant to their life. Um, and what I wanted to try to do for this project was try to um, switch, take something that is um, hard to digest in terms of a formal logic, the, the the proposal itself at the scale that it is at and try to move it into an, not an uncanny territory, but a territory that um, has some kind of hallmarks that um, a more general public would be able to digest solely for the interest in that I would like to see these kind of projects built. In order to get these projects built, you need to be able to not only speak to a larger architectural disciplinary level, but you need to be able to talk to um, a larger audience. And I'm not saying that using agriculture or nature is a cop-out, but um, I think it's a good way to try to infiltrate a, a project that is that has high ambitions and that is politically very charged with something that is a little more easily, um, is a little more easy to swallow. And, um, I, I referenced a lot of um, Dior shows, for instance, um, and I, I find the, in, the there's an interesting slippage in their set design, and that obviously these garments are out of, in a price range where 99.99% of the people on this planet would not be able to afford them. Um, but the set design that they used is um, even more so than the clothes, really digestible, really discernible, able to be. Um, 
consumed. And I'm not looking to create something that is easily consumed, but I think that there's that, there's an interesting tension that um, I'm interested in exploring and seeing where those lines and deviations exist. And so your comment, I think, speaks to that, um, that interest exactly, that, that weird slippage where um, there's tension in between something that's unconventional and conventional. You know, that, that's kind of interesting because uh, like at some level, it's a very mature thing to say uh, that I got to be able to control my representation depending on what constituents I engage. Um, I think every kind of practicing architect uh, knows how true that is, um, that uh, claiming a pure position uh, to speak to uh, different audiences is impossible. Um, like it, it's basically a dead end for an idealist. And mm -hmm. in, in order to kind of actually get to the ideal, uh, we, we play all kinds of parts. Um, and uh, that's the only plausible manner in which we can get um, ideas too, because there's always resistance at, uh, at every turn. Mm -hmm. um, I think to recognize that uh, early on is incredibly useful and in how we can operate through uh, different modes of representation to um, you know, push through those pressures are um, something very important to understand at home. So that's, that, that's a really good point. I want to ask a question um, that I could also, I think, ask of Jennifer's project, and maybe it goes for all four projects, and this might start to open up this conversation in a different way. Why do you think it is that only quote unquote, nature is the thing in all these projects that's kind of allowed to grow and disarticulate the forms or to infiltrate or to challenge the kind of rectilinear linearity, conventionally architectural components? Um, that's a really good question. I think um, throughout this program, we've learned a lot about the way in which um, mm -hmm computer logic works and specifically machine learning works um, in so far as that it's a black box. There's not really a way in which somebody can sit down and be able to explain exactly how it works. Yet through these processes that we were engaged in, there's some kind of semblance, some kind of coherence that um, erupts to the surface by using these kinds of tools. And, um, similar to what I was talking about before with the weird dissonance between something that's digestible and something that's not, um, being able to juxtapose that with something that has a similar logic, or at least in our conception has a similar logic in that it, it behaves in a certain way, it, it's predictable, but we can't explain why, and that would be the romanticized nature. And um, I think, putting those two up against one another to show the similarities, the odd um, tropes that they share, and also be able to show how they're very different and just the way that we understand geometry, whether that's something that seems more natural, something that seems more constructed by man. I think putting those two up against one another in a very um, aggressive manner is a way to kind of speak to that idea and to try to build on something to that, to that, um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know I mean, if that was very coherent. But. No, I mean, it, it makes sense. It's just curious. Like this is a, a good, this image that's going by right now is a kind of interesting one because again, there's sort of like, there still seems to be this fetishization's too strong of a word, but the sort of acceptance of the, of the, of the, let's say that the chaotic or the complexity of of the of of growth, right? Of of plant life, vegetation, what have you, and none of that sort of complexity or chaos is given over to the behavior of you know of of the animal life that would inhabit these things, at least in the in the front end, which are the human beings, right? And so there's mm -hmm. this kind, of, and so this goes back to sort of Jennifer's thing at the beginning too. There's this, you know, I I, I get it when we're thinking about housing and we're trying to think about something that's that that 
I think what was just being discussed is like you, you kind of, you have a duty to try and make these things look desirable and attractive, but there's, you know, but there's a way that sort of there's, this is only an, an early stage of use, right? This is before anybody actually inhabits these things. And then once some people start to inhabit, there's a whole set of behaviors and articulations and things that go on that kind of begin to collapse the, or, or maybe augment or accelerate this kind of uh, intervention where, you know, the plants mm. are growing on the building, but what happens when the people grow on the building and what happens when the other animals grow on the building? And that kind of goes up to what I think what Philippe was after in his project too, with the, mm -hmm. with the, with the underwater piece. But I'm, but I guess what I'm saying is like, I'm sort of curious to think then, you know, what would it mean to go back to Gia's initial point about agriculture, right? Being this immensely engineered and controlled um, uh, you know, quote unquote, natural environment, and then seeing the intervention of the of the built world as the thing that's kind of chaotic, out of control, intervening on top of that, right? And 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 trying to push the this this division, which still seems to be pretty codified within all of these projects, between a kind of uh, a, a housing um, uh, uh, trope um that you know that that isn't that somehow isn't able to get past its the sort of formalist aspect or the the for lack of a better word the kind of conventional architectural aspect and really push beyond into what what does it mean what does it mean to 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 kind of construct this large scale almost grown housing right which is that which in way which is why i think that like your project is really productive because there is this sense that you've got all of these elements that you've kind of seeded the site with, right? The precedents and the technology and the, the materials and the structures. And, and, it, and there is a sense that you've, you've, you've pulled back on the, on the, the need to control all those things because you kind of put them all together and you kind of see what comes of, comes of it. And, I'm, and, and that, that removes a little bit of the authorship sense, again, that Gia was bringing up. And I have to say that I, I kind of admire that. There has to be a willingness to say that, like, you know, I can't, I can't have an aesthetic hand in this, right? I can't have an authorial hand in it. Like, I don't authorize it. It's just what happens when you put all these things together and you see what goes. And then it's a matter of tweaking around the sides or trying to keep it from moving out into the, into the site or trying to hold people from, you know, building on your structure or do other things. But there's a kind of chaotic or complex reaction that happens. And I'm just sort of wondering in a number of the projects, there's a way of, you know, you guys are using AI to do some of this and there's a way of pushing it into that, into that, uh, past that boundary where we're still kind of in the nature culture division, it seems like. Something, I think it's a, is super interesting point to bring up because as you were talking, I'm thinking like, we, we're seeing, and this, this is my limited knowledge of just from, last term sort of seeing how the AI begins to unfold. But, you know, right now, I think we're seeing things sort of around a kind of module of the unit and that begins to sort of set the the kind of uh, aggregation in, mo in motion. Um, I wonder what happens when we start to pick apart the systems a little bit more um, and begin to sort of run sort of sort of mul multiple <laughs> conditions, right? Like a, a system of irrigation or a system of circulation um, becomes as organic or as sort of um, uh, freed from, from some of the um, primary scripts uh, could make sort of an interesting diversion and sort of maybe even create some of the conditions that were weighing on uh, elements of the natural world um, to, to produce and, and perhaps that you know, if we even go back to thinking about um, some of the precedents in this project, like Robin Hood's Garden, where the it's the circulation that actually becomes sort of these sort of civic spaces which begin to organize the building, um, or around questions of archogram or or Cedric Price, um, and how systems thinkings uh, within those uh, sort of worlds um, begin to generate. Uh, moments um, for architecture to plug in quite literally. Um, and so I think, you know, how, how do we begin to think about uh, what, what are we feeding into um, the neural network um, in order to get 
uh, the results out of it. Yeah, I like that. I, I keep I keep going back to it and I can't remember now. I think this was one of the things that I tried to briefly introduce when I visited the studio early on, but was also this notion of of more is different, right? The the kind of the the symmetry breaking moment in complex systems where if you begin with modularity, you can you can stack and build and multiply and these things can create more complex systems. But at some point, aggregates start to behave differently simply by being aggregates. And it's a, uh, you know, that, that is one of the unexplainable phenomena that we, that we currently do, don't really, un, don't have a good, uh, don't have good, good models for. And, the, and a bunch of these projects, particularly this last one, Tucker's, you know, because of the scale I'm thinking about, so how, do, how does the, how does the aggregation of all of these units and the, and the density of 500 people per acre, you know, what does that, what does that do? Right. What are, what are the outcomes there? Um, uh, and uh, and where does the where does the system move into a different uh, phase of operating? Um, and I think that the the kind of the natural environment, the growth environment, the agricultural environment are good models at first to think about in terms of the way that the the the, the machines are 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 able to help in the production of these of these forms and these systems, but it, it's, it's kind of interesting to run that backwards and think about, so where, where, what are the limit cases and how do you push those machines or how do you push those algorithms? You know, where, where is their failure mode, right? Or where does the moment where they, where they, they sort of break down or where do you get that also that kind of far from equilibrium thinking um, and, and what does that look like for a project like this? Anyway, just something I thought I'd, I thought I'd bring up. There seem, seems to still be a, a a, lo a love and a and a and a you know a real verb for the natural world here, <laughs> uh, which I think is is good, but it might also need to be challenged a little bit. Well, a use for Los Angeles, David, you're very quiet. I can't hear you. Is your volume low, David, maybe? Yeah, sorry, David, we can't hear you. Being disruptive, can you, can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> so sorry about that. Total right. buzzkill. Yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say like when I first moved to LA, I was really happy to find a house with a lot of plants. And Marcelo's been to my house, so you, you know, you know, how many plants are out there. Now, what I didn't anticipate was uh, the amount of uh, water it takes to keep all those plants alive. So the water bills are ridiculous. Uh, I'm renting, so I'm, I'm obligated to pay it. So that was an interesting surprise. And uh, mosquitoes and lizards <laughs> and gigantic raccoons, uh, uh, spiders fucking everywhere, you know. And uh, there are parts where roots are, it looks like it's burrowing through the foundations now. So that's going to be a problem down the road. Uh, so uh, it, the plants all over the buildings, uh, you know, like it's super clean. You know, there might as well be plastic flowers, you know. But uh, like that's like out of control stuff, you know, out of control growth. Uh, so, like, uh, there's some other reality that's being implied here that uh, is not uh, really the focus because uh, it seems the real project, like, uh, and I've been just listening to all of them today, uh, the real project here throughout the studio seems to be about deploying the style transfer algorithm or, style, or the GANs networks to disfigure the simple volumetric geometries of housing. So it's kind of an interesting kind of deployment of uh, the AI tool onto an architectural typology because that's probably one of the most intractable problems of simple architectural order, you know, even though it's such a crucial one, you know. 
So like uh, you use AI to uh, disfigure these simple volumetric uh, ideas, right? And so this is a great place to end actually, because there was a version of this happening in all the pro projects, I think, but then I guess uh, uh, what that disfiguring of the volumes connects with uh, varies from project to project. Sometimes it just turned into nips for furniture, other times it became a way to clean pollution, or in your case, it became uh, planters, like the mother of all planters, you know? So I think uh, maybe uh, uh, the question that uh, kind of I, I'm mulling over now that I've seen all of them is uh, uh, the disfiguring techniques of AI-based image processing. Is that a, a legitimate form of abstraction now? You know, because uh, this isn't uh, grandpa's Photoshop where you have to decide to overlay things one by one. Here uh, with the AI-based tool, uh, there is a lot of surprise. Uh, it's not entirely under your compositional control, but yet, it is producing stuff that seems useful, you know, to the, the designer that wants to disfigure these simple geometries to begin with, you know, like I think all architects are always looking for some opportunity for nuance. You know? So I, I guess uh, I don't really have an answer towards this, but it's also something very much in my mind, like, like uh, are we seeing like another category of abstraction that's now kind of uh, really technologized and automated. You know? And what do we gain and what do we give up you know, by automating that? Because you know? it is, after all, a form of automation, I think. The garden scenes here also, uh, it reminds me less of the out of control growth in my backyard, but more of like installations by Team Lab. You know, where it is a kind of a digital reality, you know, and so there is some kind of uh, nostalgia of uh, redeploying a previous lived experience in new mediums, you know, but then whenever that sort of redeployment of previous past lived experiences happen, it's usually masking something else, you know, so I want to kind of lift up the hood a little bit and see what it's hiding, you know. <laughs> my, my suspicion, I mean, if I could just venture a guess about what I think is on, under it, uh, I think uh, there's, it's underneath uh, the lusciousness and the beauty of it or the romantic nostalgia of it is a kind of anxiety about a kind of emerging in personal, bureaucratized, logistical, lived reality that we're all prisoners of to some degree you know, now. You know, so there is this kind of automated, robotic, and human, post-human kind of feel to it all, even though like on the surface, it's very, I don't know, pretty. You know, I know it's really not. You know. <laughs> I mean, within that anxiety, David, um, I mean, I think there's also a real class anxiety, which I think you speak to around the question of the cost of water. Um, and I think this comes up, it came up in Jennifer's project, um, but I think we can also sort of speak to it like, you know, who who has the, um, the privilege to, you know, to maintain a single family residence versus um, who may find themselves in a housing, apartment housing future. Um, and I, I think, you know, some of those uh, ways that we're trying to sort of find autonomy for self or sort of self-expression within it, um, you know, com comes out through, through this kind of, what we were in, within this context are calling a kind of fetishization, but really um, goes back to sort of questions of, uh, sort of self-determinancy um, and sort of independence um, within a more uh, a largely bureaucratic sort of future sort of where you know th things might be parceled out in um, ever um, uh, narrow ways.
Okay, uh, great. Um, other, I think uh, we're ready to wrap up now. Are there, are there any uh, last comments for the studio in general? Or? Everybody is good. I, I mean, from, from my point of view, that I, I, I think, and based on David, what you were just saying, I think there is a new status of work here, and it's and it's um, you know if you if you look if you look out in society in general right now the way that AI is coming into different industries and now hardcore into architecture is through pure um, kind of engineering optimization and other things like that ground plan layouts and and I see you guys and I heard you talking about it. Um, Casey, at the beginning, that you you kept saying, "Well, we're doing this, but then we're going to do this performative overlay and this and this." And I see you guys moving back and forth between that because you know a lot of times today we saw a cut and there were you know unit layouts and there were things that weren't. It wasn't just a meatball of geometry sort of coming out of some of these algorithms, which you know we we for a while you know might have entertained, but now I hear and I see you guys trying to bring it to the next level where it, it is both that new weird form of abstraction that David's talking about, but also something where it might actually, it might offer us a new way of organizing buildings, um, not just creating aesthetics. And, um, and I don't know, you know, if, if, if that's even a worthy goal to say it's gonna, it's the holy grail, it's gonna be great at both. Uh, um, but I think it's pretty interesting to have both of those things in play um, considering looking back at how a lot of algorithmic work has has oftentimes um, been, you know, uh, fallen fallen short of that kind of goal and, and tended to be um, satisfied with with an aesthetic of you know of a gradient or a variation or whatever whatever the algorithm was 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 doing. Um, so I don't know. So I think that's that's pretty interesting and and I'm I think that targeting residential too. And I know that wasn't really the discussion today so much. It was more the atmosphere in and around residing in things, I thought. Uh, but I think that's a great target. And, and I'm, I'm really excited to also just upend that whole discussion of, of you know, what is living and, um, and how do we deal with issues of repetition in new ways? Because it just seems like it's, it's just such a, the discourse on that is so dead today. So I'm really excited about that. And I think AI is gonna be a really big player in that whole discussion. And, um, and I'm just happy to see at SciArc all you guys working on, on something that seems to have this potential both aesthetic and organizational at the same time. So let's, let's see where it goes. I'm, I'm totally with you, man. I, I'm, <laughs> and I, I think it's gonna be interesting to have Tim Morton more fully with us in the coming year. And it's, uh, I, I think um, uh, we, we, we might just not have the right concepts yet. You know? And we just need to, we might have been in a period of taking, undoing a lot of concepts we've been obligated to as architects. And but uh, maybe it's, uh, it might indeed be year zero. You know? And maybe we can be a little bit more constructive now. Totally. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I agree with Tom and, and David. I, I think it's a good comment. Um, I, I think it's an interesting way to, I don't know, maybe this is like the first, I mean, in a series of studios, this is actually a kind of an interesting one where we actually have to look at the sort of even the core of, of housing units, even if they're like rough and rudimentary. Uh, and what do they do? And, and the first time we actually have taken on housing, you know, which is sort of maybe innate on the certain repetition of, of, of pieces or units and so I mean there's certainly things I'm kind of a seed to sort of like build on uh, in terms of what Tom was saying the sort of like what's out there you know the profession the field you know you're likely to take on that you know anytime when you actually engage the, the, the practice uh, but all, but if you're going to just look at this computationally look at this from the point of view of the eye the sort of building blocks of it are also going to be there. So it's an interesting kind of stage way to, to deal with sort of larger issues and uh, with aesthetics, with nature, with the, just the world at large. So I think, I mean, I don't know, there, there's something there which actually has to kind of, you know, I, I think that it has to be, that has to evolve. Uh, I remember a number of years ago, uh, Marcelo, you 
made a pretty strong move towards the volumetric in your work and your theories. And I, th I thought it was a pretty smart move because like a lot of the curvilinear linearity and complexity that was the obsession at that point, like, uh, I don't know, it was like nearly unbuildable, you know, and it was, I think, an acknowledgement of uh, the fact that the, the building industry, but not just the building industry, but maybe also like the regulatory regimes of property lines and height lines and things like that, but for even further insurance policies and that then lock all of these volumetric logics in place. I mean, it's like almost uncontestable, actually, if you want to build, you know, or inhabit the so-called real world, right? Which is also fiction, of course, but it's the fiction that is our real, right? So like uh, now that uh, we've, I, I think the larger architectural design discourse have, has also moved towards trying to reinvestigate the volumetric. I think also the younger architects are doing that too. So like, uh, uh, like what's left, you know, like uh, we start eating away at these volumes, you know, you know, maybe that's just a different strategy than outright rejecting it, you know, but then once you eat away at it, uh, I mean, at what point, like, uh, is the volume no longer there either and something else emerges, you know, in the dust. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, uh, uh, I don't think any of the projects like went that hardcore to eat away, like fuzz, fuzzy the volume until the volume simply isn't there anymore, you know? And then you get something else, you know? So like uh, there is some other managerial dimension to this, I think, uh, like in future years of the development of AI-based tools, I think you could actually manage that complexity. You know, because if you think about like the logistical problems at the scale of Amazon, they are kind of uh, fuzzying uh, the monolith uh, retail, for example. And now it's nothing but some atomized atmosphere of products flying around, right? And then, but there's something else now, you know? So like, uh, I guess I'm, I'm curious uh, for this kind of investigation to get even more aggressive. Like, I agree with David. I think that's an important uh, point. And some of it might also have to do with, I like this comment you made about needing some, a, new, a new set of concepts or a, some, other, some other tools, some other uh, uh, cognitive tools to think, think through this because some of it right now might be caught up in, a, in, a, in a, either a vernacular or a discourse that is still drawing on some, some well reified notions of, of form and typology and et cetera, and may need to adopt a whole different, um, a whole different formal vocabulary that's drawn from some of these larger um, uh, non-architectural systems, at least, as, at least as, a, as, a, as a precursor or as a, as a heuristic to kind of lever one out of a, of a, of a kind of still conventional mode of working. You know, a lot of the um, kind of maybe questions that come to my mind uh, as I go more and more uh, is AI informed studios is, um, you know, questioning our agency um, and the moment of decision making, right? Like, um, there are projects you can see pushing to an extreme where, you know, um, your hands seem to be seemingly detached from uh, from the click of the mouse that stops the process um, before, you know, uh, the thing runs itself uh, to a ground um, or very deliberately kind of controlling, push, pulling and pushing uh, certain moments and pressures on the process, which begins to maybe... Uh, insert a degree of subjectivity uh, into the automation. And I think um, these kind of oscillate between, uh, you know, the master architect on one extreme and the architecture without architects on the other. 
um, I can't tell for myself. I don't know uh, if I'm a fan of architecture without architects. Um, I'm clearly not a fan of the master architect either. Um, but maybe uh, kind of hybrid processes in which we understand when and how to intervene to carve out, um, you know, our version of the world uh, as reflected within architecture uh, is an important thing to take home. Um, and kind of seeing this work diverge within the students' output is interesting, seeing um, kind of heavy protocols diverge and find, um, you know, uh, different expressions. Uh, today, I think that was evident that we have seen kind of very different aesthetics that came out seemingly similar processes. Uh, I think that's very important to keep in mind uh, when we when we work through these processes because, you know, kind of maybe going back some of the processes that David, you talked about, uh, we have seen where all the processing work kind of began to go. It became just a uh, figureless abstractions where we could no longer tell, you know, one from the other. Um, and um, I think uh, the ability to kind of diverge this work and maintain a degree of agency, that's not just about decision making in terms of how long to run the program, but really kind of uh, um, maybe op find ways of operating in it uh, or define the terms of collaboration with it in a way that allows the subjective expressions and inquiries to still um, take hold is, uh, is important. Yeah, I think that's a, a great uh, comment, Kutan. Um, I might, uh, I, I mean, I think one, one thing though I would say maybe as a point kind of along those lines is that I, I think the notion that there's an architecture without the architect is flawed. I think it's like where the, uh, where the architect positions themselves as the author within the software stack. Like nothing it comes, there is no such thing as this kind of purely objective production machine that's somehow gonna generate architecture. Someone designed that machine to produce a certain type of architecture. I think what we're seeing here in the program and something that we're gonna be like really aggressively pushing moving forward is the kind of um, anxiety or tension that comes from students beginning to get into that gray territory about at what points are they making decisions in the, this kind of stack of automation or stack of production? What types of things are, you know, maybe formal uh, ideas that we are uh, resistant to relinquish or, you know, we have a tendency toward, but maybe don't fit comfortably within a situation or a, within the kind of situation of working at one level versus the other. And so you end up with these with the projects right now where we're trying to figure out figure that out, which leads to a lot of kind of messy, um, messy experiments, but great experiments. So I really want to thank you guys uh, this summer, especially in the kind of current uh, situation, for kind of aggressively pursuing this and like kind of stamping your identity into these, you know, the processes. Is it's always a fear I think Marcelo and I have that when we start off a semester with like a very specific. Like kind of technical workshop that will produce a really homogenous body of work but i think across the afternoon we've and the, this morning we've seen a great range of products and, and positions and kind of architectural innovations on the problem so good luck well, well, <laughs> well done everybody this is uh, great to see the, these kind of ideas coming together and all of you for the discourse today Congratulations. Congrats, everyone. And, and thank you to the jury for coming. It was a, a really great afternoon of, of feedback and comments and ideas. Yeah. The level of finish in the work was fantastic. It was very impressive, kind of heroic effort under difficult circumstances. Yes, absolutely. Congrats, you guys. You know, and thanks again for all the jurors for sticking it out. You know, actually, really, really great comment and discussion. So 